right, good morning, everybody. We're going to continue our series today entitled Think Like Jesus. Um, and I want you to think with me about this question as it relates to lust, okay? Let's take a look together. Is lust a sin? Now, just think about that for a minute. Because as it turns out, the answer to that is not always, okay? Not always. Because unlike other sins like greed or jealousy, God actually created lust. Now, let me explain that. You may be going, wait, 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 wait. Let me explain that. <clears throat> when God created the ability for Adam and Eve to have one flesh, like along with their desire for each other, with sex came as a package deal, lust, all right? It was a part of it. And he created everything. As a matter of fact, the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter one, first chapter, in verse 31, he tells us that <clears throat> after he created everything that he created, he looked at it and he didn't just say it was good. He said it was very good, okay? It was very good. <clears throat> And it's interesting because that is uh, um, kind of what helps us to understand his heart behind it. So lust wasn't me was meant to be a good thing. We could even argue that without lust, you and I wouldn't be here today, okay? And um, w also, in a healthy marriage, in a healthy marriage, well, in, in that marriage, there is always going to be lust present, like it's going to be alive and well, but focused as we're going to see today, right? So lust, as I hope you see this, that it can work for you or it can work against you. And unfortunately, a lot of people find themselves in this category in our world, maybe even here today, um, many times getting tripped up. Another one of the uniquenesses about lust is that lust is an appetite, just like our body has an appetite for food, the, um, our, our, uh, my, our heart has this appetite um, for lust. Now, when we talk about food, food can come in two categories. If we can just talk very generally for a minute, it's either nutrition or deterioration, all right? Um, and so what's interesting is that most of all that we eat, we can put into a category, either it's helping to nourish the body, right? Or it's just junk that we want, but we crave it. It's sugar, it's fat, it's delicious, but it's not doing us any favors, right? What we eat. So um, when it comes to the uh, idea of lust, it's really interesting because our bodies are going to crave what we feed it. Like the body doesn't really know until you introduce it to, and then it's like, I want more of that. And if you feed yourself what is healthy, you will start to crave what is healthy. Maybe not right away, but it will happen. It's really powerful. And what's interesting when it comes to the sin of lust, Jesus looked around his day. He saw a lot of hollow religious activity and a lot of people who were missing the point of the teaching of the Old Testament and even what he is about to teach us about this critical and important issue of lust. And what was interesting is that when it came to sexual sin, lustful sin, many people would probably respond to Jesus saying, well, listen, Jesus, we're not we are technically keeping the law. We're not technically breaking it. But Jesus would come back, and this is what he has done over and over and over throughout his sermon. But what is in your heart? What is in your heart? Over and over, we're going to see this throughout this part of his sermon, this teaching that we're going through and this think like Jesus. And he shows us that having the right heart before God is this thing he calls righteousness. To have a righteous heart or to be a righteous person is someone who has the right heart towards God. And this is how we've been defining it, trying to break it down, make it as simple as possible based on what Jesus taught, what he modeled. He showed us that righteousness is having a right love for God to love God with your heart, mind, soul, strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So to love God leads to having a right relationship with him and a right relationship with other people. You're going to want to love other people differently if you truly love God. And it's going to produce in us right actions. The way we live that out, it's going to be powerfully different. 
So in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, there are six critical life situations that Jesus is going to talk about. We've, we've looked at what do we do when we're angry with someone else? What do we do when other people are angry with us? And today we're going to look at the destructive nature of lust. Jesus is going to give us some beautiful insight on how to keep this from being the Achilles heel that destroys your relationship, destroys your life, or constantly becomes a struggle throughout your life, okay? So before we dive into what Jesus preached, let me just pose a question, because I think this is a question that gets at where Jesus is going here, all right? What if Jesus asked you just one-on-one, do you have any fantasies? Do you have any fantasies that it would be sinful if they came true? Now, (laughs) let's be honest. When we hear a question like that, we would say, wait, 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 Jesus. Now, that's none of your business, okay? Like, my fantasies are my business. You don't need to be asking me about that. As long as I don't act on them, we're good, right? I'm I'm good with you. I'm good with, with, with my spiritual life, right? Now, what Jesus is going to say next may shock you because it's going to challenge that notion that many people hold. This is what he says in Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 27. Jesus says, hey, you have heard that it was said. Like, here is the old way of thinking, but I'm going to give you a new way of thinking, okay? You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, okay? But I tell you that anyone who, let's say the highlight of words together, who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her, where? In his heart. Now, he was talking to men here, obviously, but this could apply to women as well. It's just that in the first century, men, and and this was a completely different time in history now, but they held all the cards. They were in power. They had all of the leverage. They had the authority. And many times women had to live with the consequences of the bad decisions of men. And so he was really zeroing in on them. But what he's saying here, he's saying, hey, you have heard it said, don't commit adultery. Where is he getting that from? Well, you probably remember this thing called the Ten Commandments over in Exodus chapter 20. And he is showing us commandment number seven that says, do not commit adultery, technically speaking, Don't have sex with somebody that's not your spouse, okay? This was what Jesus was getting at here. But what's interesting here is that he brings together, he doesn't just leave that one by itself. Jesus brought commandment seven, that talks about adultery, and commandment number 10, the last of the 10, that says do not covet your neighbor anything that they have or their wife. Don't desire, fantasize about, think about going after. You want it. You're, you're, you're craving it. You're jealous because they have it. You don't. He's bringing these two together. And he's saying it's not okay to desire your, your neighbor's spouse. It's not okay to, to fantasize about it because of what it's doing in your heart. This is bringing those together. Now, this made Jesus distinctly unique from all the other rabbis that were teaching. Now, I've talked about this before. Rabbi simply means teacher. And you'll see when you read the Gospels, that's what the disciples were calling Jesus many times. Rabbi this and rabbi that. It just meant teacher. And what these other rabbis were teaching their followers had nothing to do with their heart. They were not even concerned with the heart. They were just like, you guys are good. As long as you don't have actual adultery, you're not actually sleeping with other people, you're good, all right? Don't worry about it. In other words, they adopted this conveniently narrow definition of sexual sin and a conveniently broad definition of sexual purity, which made it really convenient so nobody really got convicted ever. And nobody really ever dealt with anything that was in their heart. And they walked around with a lot of false, self-righteous pride. And Jesus was saying, let's get rid of that because every sin starts on the inside, not on the outside. It starts with the heart. And we need to ask what's going on in the heart. And we tend to do the same thing today if we're not careful. You see, but what Jesus said here when he says, if you've looked at a woman with your eyes, and you have lusted after, you've already committed adultery on the inside. He just convicted every man, every woman in his audience. And he also convicted every person who would ever read his teaching right down to us today. 
He convicts everybody of this. You, you see, Jesus establishes for the first time this connection between adultery out here and our hearts and our eyes. He's saying, it doesn't start out there, guys. Come on, let's be smart about this. That's not how it works. The act of adultery always starts with heart adultery and eye adultery. It, 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 that's, this is what makes lust so destructive, the, the, the destructive component of it. It makes it really destructive. So long before adultery happens outwardly, it's happening inwardly. In other words, Jesus is showing us. Just like he taught us early in this same sermon about anger and how murder never starts out here. Murder, and in all of the cases you've ever read about, true crime situations, trying to figure out who killed who, there was anger, there was hatred on the inside that turned into insults and contempt, and eventually it turned into actions on the outside. And Jesus is showing us just like anger can turn into destruction, where you're justifying it's okay to hurt other people or to hurt their reputation or to destroy them or slowly kind of kill them behind their back or literally kill them, right? He says the, the lust does the same thing to adultery. It justifies so much. So adultery is committed with our eyes and our mind and our heart long before it becomes an action. It's just, um, it's, it's time, Jesus is showing us, it's time that we get smart about this. We start to think this through. And what's interesting is we go back all the way back to one of the first books written in all of the Bible, the book of Job. Many Old Testament scholars would say it's, it is among, if not the oldest, uh, maybe the oldest book of the Old Testament. And it's some 4,000 years ago, roughly thereabouts, when it was written. But there is some unbelievable, brilliant, and modern-day insight that could really help us today, what Job was writing about as God was showing him when he was writing this book. And here's what he said in Job chapter 31. He says, I made a covenant. There's this agreement with God. I made a covenant with my, let's say it together, my eyes, right? Not to look lustfully at a woman, all right? Even way back then, Job's like, this is a problem. I, I, don't, I don't like where this goes. I don't like where my mind goes and where it takes my heart. If my steps, in other, it's another way of metaphorically talk about choices, my choices in my life have turned from the path or God's path, God's will for me. If my heart this is so powerful. If my heart has been led by my, let's say it together, my eyes. Like, this is, a, this is where it happens. My heart begins to be led by what I see. And this is still with us today. If this wasn't true, we wouldn't in this country spend billions of dollars. Companies do this all the time on advertisements. Why? Because they work. If they put the shiny thing in front of us, we want to buy the thing, right? That is just how it works. So we lust after it. We want it. And he says, it, what does it refer to? It refers to this idea of lust, is a fire that burns to, let's say it together, destruction. It'll destroy you. Job's saying, don't play games with this one. This will hurt you. This will mess you up. This will mess up your marriage. It will mess up your life. It will burn your house to the ground, metaphorically speaking, the, the house of your life. Our hearts must train our eyes rather than the other way around, letting our eyes train our hearts. Don't just let your eyes go wherever. Don't be okay with just looking at whatever. It's so important, and especially when you are moving towards a committed relationship with the opposite sex. Like dating, I don't care what your age is. I, I talked to a gentleman this week who's 70 years old and he's starting to date again, okay? It doesn't matter how old you are. This is so important to be careful where your eyes go. Not even just with your date, but when you're not on the date. When you're, what are you looking at? Because it feeds your mind. Nutrition or deterioration. Right? So, and we begin to crave what we've been fed, both with our eyes and with our mouth. It's amazing how, how powerful it is. If you're we're in a workplace and there's some flirtation that's going on, and you think, oh, it's harmless, it's no big deal. We're just joking around, no big deal. 
There are stories of people who would tell you that have come through our church. Yeah, I thought the same thing one time. I thought, well, it's harmless, no big deal. Until it wasn't. Until it was a big deal. Until it was turning into something it shouldn't be. And I just want to caution you. Be careful to let your heart train your eyes and be wise and be discerning before those stories begin to unfold and turn into a nightmare that you can't seem to get yourself out of, not without a whole lot of pain. And so let me give you a guiding principle I think could be really helpful in this area. And here it is. Don't arouse desires that you can't satisfy in a righteous way before God. Don't arouse desires. Now, you may say, well, why, Will? Why not? I mean, we're grown people, consensual adults. Why is this a big deal? Because if you do, you will start to justify sin. You will look for ways to make it okay with you. Like, I have talked to grown men who were full-time ministry staff members at a church that have told me after the fact, I sought out the wrong counsel because I wanted a yes in an area of my life that I knew I was wrong in. We do this all the time. You don't have to be a minister. You, don't have, it, it, you have to be willing to say, what does God actually say? And I want what God wants. I want his best I don't want to settle for whatever's going to be left over after this thing train wrecked. Nobody sets out wanting to do that. And we find ourselves being drawn into places that we shouldn't be. It reminds me of an old song way back in the day. Uh, I think it was Luther Ingram that first uh, recorded it, and then later Barbara Mandrell sang it. If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. You remember that song? people seeing that still to this day and it leads them into a destructive place being careful be careful what's happening in your heart know this jesus knowing these things about us he was giving us some practical wisdom practical instruction here in this sermon what he's about to say next might shock you and it arguably could be one of the most shocking things that jesus ever says so here's the next thing that he teaches He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, and this is just another word for sin, okay? He's using this metaphor of this, we're we're walking with God, this journey with God, right? If you stumble, you sin, gouge it out and throw it away. What? Wow, Jesus, okay. He's got our attention. It is better for you, you think about somebody just literally throwing the eyeball away, right? He, he, that's an image you don't lose right away, right? It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And he goes on to say, let's, let's talk about another part of your body. He says, what if your right hand causes you to stumble? I want you to cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Okay. Wow, what is Jesus talking about here? This is the first question we got to ask. Was Jesus encouraging self-mutilation? Okay, no, he was not. Now, here's something that first century listeners of Jesus might catch real quickly that we miss sometimes. And that is this, Jesus was using a dramatic form of speech we would call hyperbole, to exaggerate, to make a point. In other words, Jesus was not illustrating, uh, he was illustrating mortification, not mutilation. Putting something to death. In other words, mortification gets at this idea. When Jesus says, I want you to take up your cross and follow me, what was Jesus saying here? What he meant was to reject sinful practices so completely that we die to them. We're as unresponsive to that sin now as a dead person, as a corpse would be. Because our heart is so completely, our mind is so completely turned to God that we're like, I want what God wants more than I want this sinful desire to be fulfilled. I want what God, I want his kingdom to reign in my life. I want the freedom, the peace, the joy, the love that comes from that, the fruit of that spiritual life with him. I want that more than the false promise 
that lust gives us in this life. This is so powerful. Over in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus just straightforward says it. He says, Whatever, uh, whoever wants to be my disciple, my pupil, my learner, my, my follower, must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. It was a symbol of death. It was a symbol of dying to self. Later, the Apostle Paul takes this teaching of Jesus and he relays it to the to churches in the New Testament. He talks about it to the Roman church. He talks about it to the church in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, I love how he says it here. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In other words, the lust of the flesh no longer has power over you and I that we are not in that kingdom anymore. We don't live as slaves to sin. And that's Jesus' language. We don't live slaves to sin anymore. We live as free people in the kingdom of God. We, We can live. He says, you have a choice. I know you don't feel like you have it because everybody's in lockstep following the lustful desires of their heart. As a matter of fact, they would shame you if you don't do it. If you don't make what was once shameful, sacred, and what was sacred, shameful. He, he, he's telling us, listen, I want you to don't follow that. Don't go that path. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path to eternal life. Jesus is show, over and over, he's trying to help us to find the kingdom. That his good news was the kingdom is available to everybody and you can come in right now. You can be my child. You can be forgiven of sin. You can become redeemed, forgiven, set free in God right now. No longer under its control. So how does Jesus teach us to practice this? How, let's get real practical. Chopping off hands and gouging out eyes. Uh, how do we live that out? That's a, obviously hyperbole for how we ought to go after the things in our life. Now, in the first century, the dominant eye for most people, maybe still for you today, is the right eye. The dominant hand was the right hand. You couldn't do what you do for a living if you didn't have your eyes and your hands. And of the eyes and the hands, the right one was considered the most valuable the most important, something that we place high, high worth on was the right eye and the right hand. And Jesus is saying, even the most valuable things in your life, are you willing to part ways with those so that you might be free? If you're tempted by what you look at, Jesus says, your eyes, don't look and do whatever you have to to put those blinders on. Not so that you can be pious and self-righteous, but so that you can be free. So that you can really, truly, fully live in the kingdom and not be a slave any longer. This is so powerful. Act as though you were blind to those objects. Get accountability. Get help, right? That leads you to sin. If the temptation comes through the things that you do, your hands, this symbolizes stuff that we do, right? Right? And then later in Matthew chapter 18, verse 8, he even says, he even includes feet. Then he says, the places that you go, where your feet take you. There are places that you go that cause you to stumble, that cause you to sin. Don't go there. Stop doing those things. I want you to cut them off. I want you to amputate them from your, from your life. Stop going. Even if you say, oh, wait, 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 Jesus, that's like really important to me. He's like, well, this should be more important. This this has to trump that. This has to be more valuable than that or you're never going to get free. He says, "I I don't want you to do it. Don't go. Don't do. Don't look. Act like your hands and feet are not available to you anymore. They're they're not yours. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tells us as much. I think it's in 1 Corinthians where he says that now you have been bought with a price. That your body is not your own. It is God's because you have been bought with the the blood of Jesus now. You belong to him. Use the parts of your body to bring glory to God because it sets you free, not because it makes you a religious, perfect, Puritan, modern-day person that can go around looking down your nose at other people. That is not why Jesus said to do these things. So it's so powerful when we begin to do this. 
And there has never been a generation, I will say, that needs this teaching from Jesus more than our current generation. Pornography, illicit sexual content is everywhere. We're always just a couple of clicks away, aren't we? Always. Everybody. Your kids, my kids, all of our kids. If they have a cell phone, you know that. And I want to challenge you that you'll be talking about these things. There should be conversation happening in your home around, because these are dangerous things. And what's interesting is that it's more than just porn sites that we need to be concerned about. It's even popular shows that people are binge-watching and streaming, all the platforms that come into our house. Now, not all of them, but many of them, even very popular ones, are infused with sexual, pornographic, illicit sexual content that should not, that should not be falling into the category of entertainment for the people who say, I belong to the kingdom of God. And his values are going to be my values. He is my king, not what is dictated in culture. I will follow him. And that is a hard, that is a difficult first step, but I'm telling you it leads to freedom. Jesus never brings challenges like this to us unless it is for our good and his glory. It will work out great. And there are times that we have to say, I'm going to obey even if I don't fully understand. It's okay. I don't have to fully understand in order to obey and to benefit from it. So powerful. Did I mention earlier, we tend to crave what we feed on? So once you start going down that road, it's very hard to shut it off. And let me just say to you, those of you, and just quietly and privately in your own heart, if you have a relationship with porn today, cut it off. Sever it. Amputate it. Because you will be free if you do. You may say, well, why, Will? Porn isn't hurting anybody. Not a big deal. You know, I'm not acting on it. Not yet. Jesus would say, but what is it doing to your heart? It, it is impossible to live feeding your heart, feeding on this, and try to cultivate a heart that is following after the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control become impossible, out of reach. You can't get to them. Like, why, why do I not feel any peace? Why do I not feel any joy? There's no pervasive sense of well-being in my life because of what you're feeding on. And it's, Jesus is saying, we got to pay attention to where our eyes and our heart are going. You see, porn, we cannot treat it as a pastime. It's not a pastime. It is a pathway to darkness and destruction. And what's interesting is there is a mounting uh, uh, amount of research that's coming out more and more that show, shows that discovering that our, the human brain chemistry actually changes when we're exposed to illicit, sexual, erotic material. You call it porn, whatever you... And it can come in lots of different forms. It's not always just a porn site. It's lots of different things. It's whatever it starts to get those chemicals going. It gets your mind moving in those fantasy directions. In other words, porn is a drug. It is a drug. It is a dopamine hit to the brain, just like any drug would do. And we feed on it. We want it more and more. But here's the tragedy, is that the more that people go back to this, it deadens our appetite for real women and men. It deadens your ability to have intimacy sexually with the opposite sex. With anybody. Like it's, it's not possible. And if you want more evidence on this, there's a great website. There's lots of them out there, but here's a really good one. Fightthenewdrug.org. Fightthenewdrug.org. Check it out. There's lots of videos, lots of content. If you just like, hey, I'd like to know. I'd like to do my research. Check it out. And what you'll find is that porn is an evil master. It is an evil teacher. And it is teaching our culture, it's teaching the next generation something that is breaking their heart. I see it more than I want to admit. And here's what it's teaching us, that real bodies aren't good enough. And I think this is probably what, what I'm about to share with you. It's detrimental for everybody, but I think it's really wreaking havoc on our young women. Really hurting. 
that wh- how that's playing out. Real bodies aren't good enough. One body isn't good enough. And if you are married, your husband or wife's body won't be good enough for you. And I, I just want to challenge you Some of you men, this might be the next big important spiritual step as a spiritual leader of your home to say, we're going to rid our home of this. We're going to be more careful. It's not that we're going to try to get legalistic and, you know, judgment, like condemning and harsh, but we're going to treat this like what it is. It's dangerous and it's going to hurt our kids. It's going to hurt us. It's not okay for anybody to be using this as entertainment. And when, especially those of you who are married, when your wife, your husband find out that they've been replaced by this, because it will show, it's going to, it will damage your ability to be intimate. It's going to break their heart. So if you are in that kind of a relationship, you have to just come to terms with, realize this is going to be your reality. This will be your future if you don't give it up, if you don't release it, you don't surrender it. Jesus is teaching us to ask an important question here. What is causing you to stumble, to sin? Now, for those of you who are like, okay, I'm ready to get free. I want to get out from under this. I don't want to live under this dark kingdom that is destroying me of the flesh, of this culture, of this world, the kingdom of this world. I want to live in God's kingdom. And you need accountability. I mean, let's be honest. You've tried on your own, you know, the, the spirit is willing, but the, the flesh is weak, and you need help. You need God's help, but you need God's people to help you. And let me give you, there's lots of anti-porn apps out there. Let me give you one I think is, I've seen it help many people, friends of mine, covenanteyes.com, covenant eyes. It's kind of based on that verse we looked at earlier from Job chapter 31. I made a covenant with my eyes. And this is a step. It's not the only one. There's many out there, but I just want to give you something to kind of help you get started, because some of you need to get started today. Don't wait. But here's the question I want to wrap up with. What do you need to stop looking at today? Stop doing. Stop going. Maybe there is a group of people that you've been going out with, and every time you're around that person or these people, they're a bad influence. Maybe the context for you is whenever there's alcohol present and you have a hard time knowing where to stop. And when you're under the influence of alcohol, it lowers your inhibitions to the point where you're flirty and you're doing and saying and acting in ways is not okay. And it's moving you in a dangerous, dangerous place. And you need to say, I'm, I'm, I'm amputating that from my life. You're going to stop going just to random wherever on the internet when everybody else is asleep or no one else is around. I'm a grown man. I'm a grown woman. I can take care of myself. I'm telling you, Satan has set a trap and he will destroy you if you don't get out of it right now. Walk away. Don't wait another day. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ is the only place where our destructive lusts can be brought under control, under his control, and he will help us. He will set us free. And I'm going to tell you today, until we learn how to love him, let our hearts be fixed on him, our eyes fixed on him, man, it is when that begins to happen and to truly accept and follow what he taught, that's when we start to get set free and we step away from the destruction, the hell, as Jesus said, that will take our life. We have to trust him. We have to place faith in him. And it is his gift of salvation that moves us out of that detrimental, destructive rut that people get stuck in all the time. And he will save us. And I just want to encourage you today that you would be willing to make that step and begin to think like Jesus. He's setting us an example. He's setting us a a, a path that we can follow. Will you follow it? Right now, I want to ask you if you would, if we go into a moment of prayer, that you would be willing right where you sit to say, Jesus, I need your help. This is the prayer, simply saying, I need you to help me to amputate whatever is causing me to sin, whatever's causing me to stumble right now. I'm not willing to let lust destroy my relationship with you or the people that I love any longer. I'm done. 
I don't want to live like this anymore. Be Lord over all my life. I'm surrendering all of me to you, God. As my heavenly Father, I trust you. Would you be willing to do that today? For some of you, God had you here so that he could set you free. But you've got to choose it. You've got to decide. You have to place faith. It takes courage. And he'll even give you the courage you need. You just got to ask for it. God, give me the courage to do this. I know I need to get free. And you've tried over and over, and it's not worked. But he can help you. Would you choose it today? Let's go before the Father and right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. Thank you, God, for giving us a pathway out. And I pray for every person here, every man and woman here that has been quietly, secretly justifying this secret sin in their life of giving in to lust. God, may there be freedom today beginning first with the step of asking for forgiveness. Would you just ask him right where you sit, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me for letting my heart become seduced by lust. And I, I have been feeding on it to such a degree that it, it has become a God, little g, in my life. It has become an idol. And, and it is a evil, merciless idol that will take everything from you if you don't repent and turn to the Lord now. Would you turn to him and just say, Jesus, I turn to you right now. I ask for your help. I want freedom from this. I'm sick of living like a slave to it. It's like I don't even have a choice because you don't. But you do. Jesus says you do have a choice. But you have to choose him. Would you choose him right now? Just say, Jesus, I choose you. I want my heart to go after you, to long for you, to love you in the place of this dark master that has taken over and taken hold of me right now. If you're giving, you're surrendering to Jesus with every eye closed, every head bowed right now, would you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you right now. I'm giving it over to you, Jesus. I'm, I'm sick of living as a victim. God bless you guys. Anybody else? I'm, I'm seeing hands going up. God bless you, men and women. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are speaking to our hearts today. We don't have to live as victims anymore. May we choose the breakthrough you're offering. May we choose you today. God, I pray for every hand, every heart that is yielding to you, every heart that is saying yes to you right now. I want free from this. I don't want to stumble here anymore. God, may you give them the strength they need. Give them an accountability partner. Give them the strength and the courage to take that next step with you starting right here, right now. Make up your mind. Intend in your heart to never go back, to amputate, to sever, to, to, to respond as a corpse, as a dead person to that sin. No more am I going to live under its power anymore. You're going to be free now. A whole new life with Jesus. You may lower your hands. And Lord, right now, as we're still in this moment of prayer, I pray for every person that can hear my voice online, here in person here in the room, that would honestly say, I want Jesus to take over my life, and I have never formally done that, and I want today to be the day that I call Jesus my Lord. I ask him to forgive my sin and I surrender my life to him right here, right now. If you're ready to do that and you know God is prompting your heart, he is nudging your heart that today is the day and now is the time, would you just pray right where you sit, Jesus, I'm yours. Forgive me of all the sin that has kept me from you for all these many months and years. I'm yours. I give you all of me and I will follow you from this day forward. Scripture tells us that when we declare him as Lord of our life, that the 
totality of the the population of heaven, all the angels of heaven break into celebration over just one lost sinner repenting to Jesus. Right now, heaven is celebrating. If you just gave your life to Christ, you just said yes to Jesus, would you just lift your hand right now? Just, I want you just to, to, to share. I'd love to pray for you right now. Anybody here? God bless you, sir. I see you right there. Anybody else? Giving my life and my heart fully over to Jesus. Anybody in the balcony? Giving it all over to Jesus today. We thank you for your love, God. Thank you for the way out. We love you. We praise you, God, because you love us that much to set us free from the things that imprison our hearts. We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you back next week. And we're going to talk about the power of your words. Have a great week. We'll see you then. Oh, it's Father's Day next Sunday. So don't forget that. All right.